Well, snow or no snow, here we are. It's a great day to be alive. It's a great day to be in church. It's a great day to worship God. I would agree with what Pastor Brian was saying, that God is faithful. God is so good. And we're going to be talking about a good God today who is faithful. It's the title of the message this morning, The Faithfulness of God. Here's what I want to remind you. I I said this on January 1. This could be the year that Jesus returns. Don't forget that. Every day we got to live with this perspective that uh, he could return and I want to be ready. I want him to, I want him to come. I want to be part of those that join him in the sky and forever be with him. And so anyway, just a reminder, this could be the year that Jesus returns. So let's be watching. Let's be ready. Let's, let's be, uh, let's be looking for him. Does that sound good? Yeah. Our, our vision is heaven here. And our goal and our mission is to take as many people with us as possible. So let's not lose sight of the vision. We're in Genesis chapter 12 today. We're continuing in our Genesis series. This morning, Genesis 12, talking about Abram. Some of you know him as Abraham. He had a name change somewhere along the way. So did his wife. Here we're going to read about her, Sarai. She, her name was changed to Sarah. Uh, but Abraham probably, without a doubt, one of the most famous people in the Bible. I would say that at least he's in the top 10. Um, Last Sunday evening, Jared Atchison started in this chapter, chapter 12, talking about the call of Abraham. The Bible introduces us to Abram in Genesis chapter 11. At the very end, there's a short genealogy there, um, and we see his name mentioned there. And then in chapter 12, it is his story. And so from the rest of the book of Genesis is the story of Abram and his family. And so here, here's what uh, chapter 12 starts out, verse 1, telling Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. And then in verses 2 and 3 of Genesis, he gave Abram a huge list of promises. This is what he said. He said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing to others. God said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt or disrespect, and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. That is an incredible list. If God gave that to you, you'd be jumping up and down. You're going to make me famous. You're going to bless me. You're going to take care of me. You're going to provide for me. You're going to make me into a great nation. He said, at one point uh, in Genesis 15, he takes Abram, the Lord takes Abram outside of his tent. And he says, look up, look up at the sky and try to count the stars that are there. Anybody ever tried to do that? This is, he said, listen, your descendants are going to be greater than the number of stars in the sky, greater than the number of uh, grains of sand on the seashore. He's saying, this is what I'm going to do for you. And then in verse 4, he tells Abram to leave. And it says that Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. He was 75 years old when this happened, when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai. He took his nephew Lot, all of his livestock, and all the people that were in his household in, in Haran. And he headed for a land that God hadn't even told him where to go. He just said, you go, I'll lead you there. But upon his arrival in Canaan, He set up camp. The Bible says he built altars. He dedicated them to the Lord, and he worshiped God there. So God told Abram, go, and he was obedient to follow all the instructions of the Lord. That's what I want to be said of me. Not only that God is faithful to me, but I'm faithful to him. Before we get into the message this morning, I want want to remind you of something. This story that we're gonna read today, Genesis 12. We'll get there, we'll get there eventually. It's not gonna be right away until we read that scripture. But this story of Abram is about his calling, his blessing, his family, his obedience, his disobedience, and it's all about Abram. But Abram is not the main character of the story. Who's the main character of this story? God. God is the main character of every story in scripture. We cannot forget when we read scripture that this isn't just about this man. This is about God. This is about his faithfulness. And we're going to be reminded of the faithfulness of God in this story. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. We're reminded again of the faithfulness of God. The very first 
verse in our passage today. I'm going to read one verse with you. Verse 10. So God has given him these promises. He told him to go to the land he would show him. And he gets there. And the very first verse that we read after he gets there, he builds altars, he, he worships, he dedicates the place to the Lord. It says this, now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. So the very first thing that we see, God gives a promise and then comes a test. And the test was, there was a severe famine in the land that God had led him to. You would think that with Abram's obedience, that he would be rewarded with favor in this new land. That he would arrive to fertile fields, that there would be plenty of food, plenty of water. That the travel would be easy and there would be comfortable living in this new place that God was blessing him with. But that's not what happened. And really, that rarely ever happens in a life lived by faith. Why is there a famine in the land of promise? This is the promised land. And the very first thing we see is a famine. I can only imagine what Abram must have been thinking. This is what I would be thinking. God, did, did I hear something wrong? Did you even speak to me? Or was that just me? Am I in the wrong place? Ever thought those thoughts before? Faith 101 says your faith won't grow from blessing to blessing to blessing. Our physical muscles don't grow without some kind of resistance. You think of weightlifting. The only way we're going to grow physically is with resistance, and it's the same spiritually. We don't like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No one of us does. We would prefer to be airlifted from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. That's how we would like to live. But God's way of doing things often is to give his people famines in the midst of faith. Our faith is often tested. Maybe it doesn't come after a great act of obedience, but know this, there are tests and those tests will come. How many of you found that to be true? Test to our faith. We tend to think that following God and calling and, and his calling in our life means that there's going to be no obstacles or opposition. When bad things happen, we tend to question, is this God? Why would God call me here only for this to happen? Here's a key to us in living by faith. The presence of problems does not mean the absence of God. The presence of problems in your life does not mean the absence of God. We know that God is faithful. He promises through his word that he will always be with us. His way may be the hardest and the most difficult, but his way is always the best way. I thought I'd get some amens there. God's way may be the hardest and the most difficult, but it's always the best. Here's what I know. I'm better off in God's will with a famine than out of God's will with blessing and provision. James said this, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Peter said this, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Paul said this, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop perseverance. And there's a whole list of things that come when we pursue that. This is all about being people of faith. There are tests, there are trials, there are difficulties. But listen, a life of faith isn't discussing what we deserve or the rewards that we get. A life of faith is trusting God no matter what. Psalm 62, 8 says, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him for God is our refuge. Some people think faith is just a leap in the dark, farthest thing from the truth. It's standing on the proven faithful character and nature of God. And we read all about him throughout the scriptures. We're going to be reading some of those things today. Abram 
had faith, no doubt. Why would he pack up, leave his, his family, leave the place that he knows to go to some place where he had no idea he was going? He was obviously a man of faith, but we also see that he was human, just like us. And even though we read in the New Testament that sin has no power over our lives, that power of sin was broken by the work of Jesus on the cross. We sang about that this morning. I'm free. Forever I'm free because of what Jesus has done. Death was arrested, and then I began living. Sin was, sin was, the power of sin was broken, and now I can live free. But sin still has a way of clinging to us. And if we give it room in our lives, it will cause us to fall. So why does God give Abram this test right away? Isn't his obedience to follow God from where he was to Canaan proof enough of his faith? What we see is that this test of severe famine revealed some tendencies in Abram. God wanted to reveal to him some things that needed to be dealt with. Not just to reveal them, but to deal with them. So going through a test or a tri trial reveals what is in us. Like a sponge, you can squeeze a sponge and, and what's inside of that sponge is what comes out. That's what happens when we go through these trials and tests. What's on the inside is gonna come out and God wants to reveal what's in us so that he can deal with that and we can, we can move on. So let's read this about Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Starting with verse 10, we're gonna see some tendencies. We're gonna see some instincts that are in Abram. Remember, God had given him the promise, had sent him to this land, and this is what we read. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because there, the famine was severe. And he's, as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and that my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was very, a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. He got rich on this deal. How many of you think this is a good plan? <laughs> Guys, how many of you traveling with your wife would say to your wife, hey, tell them you're my sister, that way they won't kill me. That way they'll spare me and treat me well. Terrible plan. <laughs> this is the man of faith. So he treated Abram well, and it says, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. He's getting kicked out of Egypt. And then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Let me make just a couple of observations for you. One, when you leave God, it's always spiritually down. When you leave God, it's always spiritually down. It says that Abram left and went to, down to Egypt. And it says that he went to live there for a while. He had just got to the land of promise. And he says, listen, I'm taking a vacation. I'm getting out of here. And I'm not, I'm not judging him for going to find food for his family. Noble that he would do that. But one thing that we notice here, never does he consult God. Never does he ask God, is this what you want me to do? And the further we are from God, the more likely we are to sin. It said, as he was approaching the border of Egypt, talked to his wife and said, this is what we're gonna say. Tell me you're my sister, not my wife, because they'll wanna kill me. It was selfish, it was self-focused so that he would be treated well and that his life would be spared. So what we see here is that Abram had a trust problem. He had faith in God to leave his home and to go where God had led him, but his tendency 
because of his lack of trust, was to deceive and to lie. God not only wanted to reveal this to Abraham, Abraham, but he wanted to deal with him. The test that God often puts us through or allows to happen in our life doesn't just reveal our flaws, but it's intended to deal with them. It's not good enough just to know what your flaws are. Let God deal with those things. Abram had a greater faith in himself. His instinct, as I said, was to lie and to deceive and to cheat. And God wanted to work on those things so that Abram would be ready for the promises that God had given to him. And God wants to do the same thing in us. He wants to prepare us to be all that that we can be. That's why the trials, that's why the difficulties, that's why scripture tells us over and over, don't think of something strange happened to you, consider it pure joy. Don't go around the trial, go through them. God is wanting to reveal and deal with things in your life to make you better, more mature and complete so that you don't lack anything. Think of the difficult times that you've been through where you've been tested, where the pressure was on. What were or what are your tendencies? What is your first response to those trials and difficulties? What do those trials reveal? What have they revealed about you that God needed to deal with in your life to make you better, to make you stronger, to make you more mature? It's revealed in this narrative that Abram had a propensity to deceive and to lie. And he doesn't deal with it here. We know that because just Eight chapters later in Genesis chapter 20, the same exact thing happens. So he's in the land, King Abimelech is there, and he says the same exact thing. He says, tell him you're my sister. And so Abimelech takes Sarah, his wife, takes him into his home to be his wife. Does the same thing. Genesis 26, his son Isaac does the same thing with his wife Sarah, with Rebecca, to King Abimelech. He says, because you're so beautiful, tell him you're my sister, because otherwise he's going to kill me to have you. So you've got Abram, his son Isaac, and then you've got Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's name literally means what? Deceiver. These are Abram's grandsons, Jacob means deceiver, and twice he deceives his brother to gain the birthright and to gain the father's blessing. Jacob has 12 sons, and if you know their story, they're so jealous of their younger brother Joseph that they scheme to kill him. They decide, we'll just sell him into slavery, but then they go back to their father Jacob and said, with his coat that Jacob had given him covered with blood and said, a wild animal must have eaten him. Lie and deception. And this goes on and on and on. Because Abram didn't let God deal with his tendency, it became a trend through the generations of his family tree. Some would call this trend a a generational curse. But this morning I want to give you a a different perspective or a, a perspective on that. I want to make a couple of observations here. Listen, first, oftentimes... More is caught than taught in our lives. We can teach, but our example says a lot. Another way of saying that is actions speak louder than words. People have a tendency to copy what they see and what they hear, both good and bad. We tend to learn our values and behaviors from the practices of other people. And the truth is, we need both. We need teaching and We need godly examples. So what does scripture say about this? We get the thought of generational curses from Exodus chapter 20. This is the 10 commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse four and five, God says, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them and worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. 
God says, I'll lay the sins of the parents on their children. The entire family is affected. There are a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament, if you want to write this down, that, that, that have similar language. You can look at Exodus chapter 34, 6 and 7. I'm going to read that in just a moment. Numbers 14, 7 to 19. Deuteronomy 5, 8 to 11. All speak this language of the parents' sins being laid on to their children. But you got to think of the context. Exodus chapter 20, he's given the law. He's, he's saying no other gods. And this is a conditional statement. He says if you make idols, there's going to be problems and there will be consequences. He said, I'm a jealous God. Don't bow down and worship them. Listen, Exodus chapter 34, this isn't going to be on the screen. You'll have to just go look, look this up later. This is what it says. Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. He says, I am slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I am slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love on a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity and rebellion and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents on their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children to the third and fourth generations. While that is happening, Moses is on the mountaintop getting the covenant with God. What's happening down with the people is they said, we need, we need some gods. And Aaron, Moses' brother, says, get me all your gold. And you know the story, they fashioned a golden calf. And listen to what they said. They, they, they put all their jewelry together, melted it down, formed this idol. And this is what they said. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. How awful is that? God is the one who brought them out. He said, you should have no other idols before you. I'm a jealous God. You're going to say that that golden image that you made, that's what delivered you out of Egypt? I read one commentary that said that's about as bad as the bride kissing one of the groomsmen at the wedding. <laughs> really? God wants our worship. And he's saying, I won't tolerate you serving other gods. These, these are sin and they will continue to follow generation after generation. You start something like that happening, and guess what your children are going to do? The exact same thing that you did. And guess what they're going to do with their children? The exact same thing that they learned. That's what happens. Generation after generation, you keep repeating the choices of your parents and grandparents. And until someone breaks that cycle and chooses to love and follow God's commands, it's going to keep happening. I want to read the rest of Exodus 25. He says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. There's a condition. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You want to change the pattern, the cycle of your life? Follow God. Obey his commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Listen, there are characteristics and qualities. He said, I am a God of compassion and mercy, slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love on a thousand generations. I forgive iniquities. I forgive rebellion. I forgive sin. This is the character and the nature. This is what we know about God. Are we really going to believe that I'm cursed and there's no hope for me? Listen to what Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 19 to 22. He says this, what, you ask, doesn't the child pay for the parent's sins? No, for if the child does what is just and right and keeps my decrees, that child will surely live. The person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins, and the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Are you thankful for that? You're not going to be punished for the choices and decisions that your kids grow up and make. It hurts you. It affects you. It breaks your heart. There's consequences that come. But you don't pay the price for that. Pray for your children. Pray for your parents. 
Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior, and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. But if wicked people turn away from all their sins and begin to obey my decrees and do what is just and right, they will surely live and not die. All their past sins will be forgotten, and they will live because of the righteous things they have done. So thankful for God's faithfulness. He's saying, listen, there's going to be accountability for your sin. And unless you change your ways, there's a price to pay. But God is merciful. He is gracious. He is filled with loving kindness. He forgives sins and iniquities. He forgives all of that. New Testament, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, curses everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing that he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, if you were a Christian, you have been set free and you are no longer bound by any curse. The only curse that you inherited in your family tree is the curse of sin and death through Adam and Eve. But in Christ Jesus, we are new creations. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they are new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. I am so thankful that our sin was paid for and purchased by the blood of Jesus and the curse of sin through the cross is broken. We've been adopted into a new family, the family of God, a family tree that is absolutely amazing. We've been adopted and grafted into that. Listen, it's my belief as I read scripture and you could take, if, you, if you've got a, issue, come talk to me, please. I, I, I'm not trying to say I've got the authority. I'm just saying as I read this and, and as I understand and know who God is, his nature, his character, I don't believe that there are curses that we have no choice. There are definitely consequences. There's definitely a culture in families. There's a, an accountability that comes. But I could believe that God is warning each of us that each generation is gonna be held accountable if they continue to repeat the sins of the previous generation. But that cycle can be broken from generation to generation. We see in Abram there's tendencies, there's behaviors that repeat themselves. But you deal with, you deal with those consequences of your choices and those consequences would impact his family line all the way down. There are definitely consequences. And listen, coming to Jesus isn't a magic eraser that changes all the consequences. What's done has been done, but thank, thank God that he meets us right where we are and that his blood covers our life. I believe that Satan would like to make us believe that we're under some kind of a curse and that generational curses imply that we have no choice. We're just bound to do this, that there's no way. We're just gonna fall in the same way that our grandfather did or our great-grandmother did. We make excuses. Listen to what we say. That's just how I was raised. That's a lie. It's just how I've always been. Well, you know, my mom did this, so my, my dad and my grandpa always, so I... I made these choices in the past and I just keep doing them. Listen, I think that God wants to break those things in our life and I think he wants to set us free from the past and the, from the consequences of our sin. Let me read one more scripture for you found in Romans chapter six, verse five. Since we have been united with him in his death, we also will be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. Death no longer has power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. There is so much hope for us today. There is so much that we have to look forward to. We're not bound by the past. We're not bound by the choices of our parents and our grandparents and generations ago. We can be set free. 
So I don't know what your thinking is today, but I believe the Lord has just kind of impressed me through this message. I didn't even know this was the way this was going to go. But as Pastor Luke and I were studying and, and, and talking about this, I just had this overwhelming sense that there are a lot of people who are living under condemnation from things that happened in their own past and things that happened in their family line that God is saying, listen, you've been set free from that. Live a life for Jesus. It doesn't matter what your grandparents or your parents, your relatives, or even what you've done. There is new life in Jesus Christ. You have the opportunity, you have the power to choose a different path. There are people here this morning, you are needing to choose freedom. You want to be set free. You can be the one in your family to change the culture, to change the pattern, the cycle of behavior in your life. Would you stand with me all across the room? Maybe there's a cycle of sin in your family, of addiction, or alcoholism, or anger, or abuse, pornography, or unforgiveness. Whatever might be in your life, Jesus wants to meet you here today and set you free. It might be like Abram, lies and deception, bitterness. You've got a victim mentality. It may be a, a number of things. Listen, I want to invite you this morning. If you want to be free, I want to invite you to come and we're going to have ministry. Listen, this is what the enemy will say, that this space right up here, this is the place of shame. Don't ever go there because people are going to see you and they're going to judge you and they're going to say, I wonder what's wrong with them. I wonder what they're... Listen, in this room right here, is there judgment? Anybody judge you? Listen, if, you, if you've got something in your life, don't carry it with you any longer. Pastor Luke talked about this a couple of weeks and just baggage that we carry around with us. Let go of it. Let Jesus set you free. So I don't know what your past is. I don't know what the thing that you're struggling with. And nobody's going to ask you unless you want to tell somebody. But I'm going to invite you to come and just stand here. Listen, there's no shame. This is where freedom happens. This is where people are set free, where they're delivered, where they no longer can carry the past with them. You leave it here at the altar. Jesus covers it and takes care of it. How many of you would love for that to happen in your life? Maybe in your children's life. Maybe you're standing in for your child today. You're saying, listen, if it's up to me and I can do anything about it, I'm going to stand in the place of my children or my parents or, or whatever that might be. But you would just come today and respond. If you're joining online today, stand right where you are. Let go of those things and let Jesus minister into your life. So we sing the song, you would come. Just want to invite you to come and stand across the room. Or if you're saying yes to Jesus and you want to know freedom and forgiveness and salvation, you've not experienced that or you've walked away from it. You've gone down to Egypt like Abram and you're coming back in. I want to invite you to come across the room while we sing this song. Would you come? God loves us so much. God loves us so much. And we talk about the faithfulness of God to know that he is faithful to pick up pieces in our life and make something incredibly beautiful out of the pieces and the destruction that the enemy wreaks havoc in our lives. And we live with this, this truth and this hope that God extends his love to thousands of generations that choose him. That is a promise that we have. not live with this idea that I can keep doing whatever I want to knowing that God is faithful because all we're doing is building more consequences in our life come to Jesus live for Jesus let him set you free live free it's not being perfect it's leaning on him and trusting in his work in our life there's a scripture I believe it's in Galatians that talks about sowing and reaping and it talks about the kind of seeds that we sow. And it also talks about what field that we're sowing our seeds in. That if you, you sow in the, the, the field of the flesh, you're gonna reap destruction. You sow in the field of the spirit, you're gonna reap life eternal. It's, the, it's where you're planting seeds. And it's the kind of seeds that you're planting. You can't expect to plant a seed of corn and have something else come up. The Bible says you're going to reap what you sow. So sow to please the Spirit. Sow to please Him, not yourself. Don't live for self. Put your faith, your trust in the one who is faithful. 
the one who is faithful to complete what he began in you. This is our God. Father, I thank you today that you love us so much. I thank you, God, that we can be set free from the, the sin and the law of death that, that resides in us through sin, but you broke that curse of sin. It's forever broken. We choose you and we accept your gift of life. We accept your offer of, of lavishing love on us and to generations that come. God, may we sow the right kind of seeds in our life. God, that we would affect change of people around us by being godly examples in the words that we say in the actions and behaviors and patterns of our life for our children, our grandchildren. God, we love them so much. We need your power. We need your presence. We need your spirit actively, fully engaged and working in our lives to be all that you want us to be. Lord, as we go through the trials, remind us this is working good in my life. God, you will bring good out of whatever this is. Lord, you are with us through it all. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So God, we, we want to keep on enduring, persevering until the day comes when we see you face to face. heads bowed, your eyes closed, I want to give opportunity for anyone that has not accepted Jesus, you've not given your life, you've not accepted his free gift of salvation, and today you're choosing that. If that's you today, maybe you've walked with him and you've just walked away, or maybe you've never made this choice to say, I want Jesus to forgive my sins, I want to know that I have this, this hope in life and that the heaven is my reward and that I'll be with him forever. If that's you today and you want to receive that gift of salvation, would you just raise your hand and keep it raised? I want to pray with you this morning. Anyone in the room? Anyone online? Wherever you are, just pray this prayer. Jesus, I receive you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Change my heart. Set me free. Help me to follow you in all that you want to do in my life. I give you my life. Have your way in me. Thank you for forgiveness, for salvation, for hope, for life. I receive it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you made that decision today, I need you to tell somebody. You can, you can email me, jeff at newhope.church. That's maybe an easy way to do that. Or you see one of the pastors at the door, just say, hey, I made a decision today. You can stop at the Welcome Center. There's some materials there that we would love to give you. But if you made that decision, please tell somebody today. If you're online, email, whatever's best. Um, thank you for being here today. And I pray that God would download things into your life that you can take and walk away today and that our lives will be forever changed because of Jesus. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Find a good class.